Podcasts are pretty common. So what makes the Uncommon Podcast uncommon? Well, it's all in our name. I'm your host, Noah Weiss, and we at Uncommon Sports Group understand the unique pressures and temptations that come with a career in the sport industry. We provide Uncommon training that helps you successfully navigate common challenges. Hit the follow button on this podcast. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Check out our website and become Uncommon. What's up, USG fam? Welcome back to the Uncommon Podcast. I'm your host, Noah Weiss, and I'm excited to be joined today by Wayne Simeon. And if you're a college basketball guru, then Wayne will need no introduction. But for those of you who are not familiar, Wayne was a forward for the Kansas Jayhawks from 2001 to 2005, as well as spending two seasons in the NBA with the Miami Heat. During his Kansas career, he was a three-time Big 12 champion with four NCAA tournament appearances and two trips to the Final Four. And his career with the Miami Heat led to him becoming an NBA champion during the 2006 season. In 2009, Wayne officially retired from professional basketball and began serving with the campus ministry called to greatness. And in 2021, Wayne joined the University of Kansas Athletic Department as the Assistant Athletic Director of Engagement in outreach administration. Wayne, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Noah. Thanks for the work you're doing on uh, Uncommon Sports Group. Uh, love the podcast, love your resources, love the, the leaders that you're creating and, and excited to be on today. I really appreciate that, Wayne. And, and I'd love to center our podcast today, today around your faith story and how you came to know Christ. I think it's just such a powerful story and one that God has really used uh, in the sports world. And, and I want to start from the outside looking in. You starting at Kansas, growing up in Kansas as a Jayhawk fan, it would seem that as you jumped into being a college athlete, a college basketball player for one of the premier programs, that you had everything you could ever want. But you had you had a feeling that something was missing. You had a feeling that there was there was something lacking in your life. So I'd love to share when did that begin and what was going on inside of you despite the success you were having as an athlete. Yeah, yeah, I thought I um, felt like I started to kind of feel that that longing and uh, and desire for something greater to live for than myself in basketball. Um, you know, probably midway through my sophomore year, um, you know, had experienced a lot of success uh, on the high school basketball scene and early in college. And and even though I grew up around some expressions of faith uh, from a Christianity standpoint, I, I wasn't a Christian. Like mm. Jesus wasn't. Uh, my Lord, it wasn't someone that I was actively following. And so uh, I had got my worth and my identity and my value found uh, in uh, the applause of the crowd, the approval of, of people and coaches mm -hmm. and what the stat sheet looked like. Yeah. And uh, as you can know, in the sports world, that can lead you on an up and down roller coaster of a, of a wave of, of, of emotions mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and an inaccurate picture of your real value and purpose. And yeah. so... Um, as I quickly came to that that realization, and as I, I was I was trying to act like I had it all together on the outside, um, then you know was caught up in in wild living and, and different things like that on the college campus. On the inside, I was really longing for something greater, something mm -hmm. better. Uh, and I'm so thankful that uh, the Lord uh, actually had my life uh, intersect with uh, with the campus minister while I was hanging out in between classes one day, mm -hmm. uh, not really actively looking, more internally searching and longing. And uh, there was someone that had the courage and compassion enough to come up and sit down next to me on the steps mm -hmm. in between classes, uh, ask me sincere questions about my life, and then begin to tell me how Jesus had transformed their life as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can remember responding back like, whoa, like, dude, your life sounds like a Bible story, like something like that. Did something yeah. like that really happen? And he looked me in the eye and says, yeah, and God wants to do it in your life, too. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I was like, hey, man, tell, tell me more. That sounds amazing. And I wow. uh, began to spend some time with this guy and, and got connected with campus ministry and the church, began to read the Bible for the first time. And it was amazing that the life of Christ on the pages of the gospel uh, was so much bigger and so much more than who I'd ever thought mm -hmm. he was. And then I began to see the life of Christ lived out in them, mm -hmm. uh, other people that were filled with, with passion and joy 
and purpose and conviction and yeah. boldness, like really trying to live this thing out. Wow. Uh, and it was only a matter of time, a short matter of time where I, I pushed all my chips in on the table and said, Jesus, my life is yours. Mm. And, uh, and the rest has been history since then. So powerful, Wayne. So powerful. And, and what I love is that you had the honesty to really realize that you might have everything that the world would say is a good thing and that would, would provide you joy, but there was something still missing, still lacking. And, and that kind of leads into what I wanted to ask you next, Wayne, is you know, for so many young people, whether they want to play sports professionally or work in sports professionally or at the college level, there's a misconception that getting to that level, having that success, you know, being a part of a, a pro team or winning championships will give you joy. So just share with us, what is that misconception? How do people often miss the mark in that thinking? And where, where does true joy really come from? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, and I like the language that you're using there. You know, you talked about joy and, and kind of in that journey, uh, both in, in my, during my collegiate career, my short professional career, I really mm -hmm. found out the difference between happiness and joy. Yeah. Uh, you know, happiness is more tethered to circumstances, you know, whether it's getting a start, having the big performance, winning the big game, but joy is something uh, that's more permanent. Joy is something that's, um, you know, can rarely be taken away from you. Joy is something that you have control over, that you don't hand over the controls to, to anybody else to be able mm. to take it or use it or manipulate it. Uh, and so that was kind of a reality uh, that I got a chance to experience in that, uh, hey, you know, the, the big nights on, on the town, big games, you mm. know, having your name on the NBA draft board, hearing your name called by the commissioner, collecting the trophy, yeah. stadiums filled with people cheering for you, seeing your name on jerseys, bopping around town, like, you know, it feels good for the moment, but it's really temporary in, mm -hmm. in so many ways. And, uh, you know, one of the, the things that I think I, I, I really uh, was most potent and important about my short time in NBA was when we won that world championship. Uh, you know, we won, I believe it was on a Tuesday or some kind of early in the week. And then on a Thursday, we had the, the big championship parade and all anyone could talk about is, are we going to do it again next year? Yeah. Uh, you know, and so you think about the pinnacle of athletic success, you know, being in the NBA, being world champions. Mm. Uh, and it only lasted a matter of days because the narrative shortly after that is, are you going to do it again next year? Who can repeat? Who's coming back? Who's doing what? Mm. And it really points to a reality in the, in the scriptures. Um, and you kind of alluded to it there early. Um, you know, first Peter chapter one, verse 24, where it talks about man and all his glory are like the grass and the flowers of the field. Mm -hmm. You know, the grass withers and the, and the grass fades, but it's the word and the will of God that stands forever. And mm -hmm. so that's something that we really have to wrestle with, you know, as, as competitors, as people that, that want to win and be successful, you know, whether it's basketball or the business world or whatever it might look like, mm -hmm. uh, for the listeners out there is like, man, are you really going to give your precious, you know, lifetime resources, efforts, and energies to something that's going to fade away? Hmm. Or will it be to something that has the opportunity to last forever, uh, to impact and transform your life, but also the lives of those around you? And, uh, and hmm. I found that in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and it's as satisfying and as challenging and as adventurous as anything that I've ever been a part of. Hmm. Uh, and, and it's part of my life's mission to make sure that that truth be told and to really partner with people uh, and helping them understand that reality and also pursue the things that matter, uh, which are found uh, in Scripture. That's amazing, Wayne. I love that you mentioned that. And, and I think sports is unique to any other career in that it takes a lot of your time, right? If you're the athlete, if you're working you know, in, in college athletics administration, if you're working in pro sports, it's going to demand a lot of your time. And even more than that, your success is defined on performance. And so there's this immense pressure and, and misconception that, once I've reached a certain level of success, that's when I'll be happy. That's when I'll get there. And I love what you mentioned about your time with the with the Heat and how soon after that championship, you guys were already talking about the next one and uh, just how quickly those those earthly glories fade. It's, yeah, it's I mean, well, it's funny. You know, I get a chance to be around a lot of teams uh, now, both here at the University of Kansas. You know, mm -hmm. the, only, the youth teams that I coach, I've got five kids and they're all involved in sports. And then yeah. I also get a chance to visit, you know, other campuses and, you know, it's been over 20 years, um, you know, plus since I've been, you know, off the college campus and, and out of the basketball limelight, per se. Yeah. And it's so interesting that, you know, career wise, um, you know, individually, you know, I was one of the best players ever 
to play at one of the winningest blue blood programs in all of college basketball. Yeah. But I love that whenever I walk into a, a locker room or a campus that I need an introduction. And most of the people uh, <laughs> that are listening in those audience have no idea yeah. what I had accomplished. It's like, wait, what? Like, dude, you were one of the top dogs at one of the best programs ever. Mm. And you get an introduction and people don't know you. And I love it because it proves the point exactly, right? 100%. That it all fades away. And that, you know, even most of the accomplishments that uh, that I had a chance to, to um, you know, to be able to be in, involved in mm. have been outdone or duplicated, mm. um, which again, lends itself to the point, hey, all that stuff fades away. Yeah. Like, hey, it's good. Like, it's great to be successful and, and you want to, you know, have competitive excellence, you know, especially as Christians, like we, yeah. we should be the best at, at what we do. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, basketball, sports, you know, success, wealth, riches, it, they, they're good to a degree, but they're a terrible God. Hmm. Oh, without a doubt, Wayne. It, it makes me think of Ecclesiastes when Solomon, in all his wisdom from God, says, Nothing new under the sun happens, right? Nothing, there's nothing new. Something that I've done or that you've done will be repeated or already has been done in, in history. And so I think we can be reminded uh, these things cannot be our God, and that's that's so powerful. Yeah. And Wayne, I want to transition. You talked about how, how a campus minister met you during your basketball career, during what you're, a point in your life when things were going so well from the outside, but but he shared with you a message that changed your life. I'd love for you to, to dive more into that story and and just what that, that time was like in hearing that good news of Christ. Yeah, um, well, it, it was just one encounter, which which I'm thankful for. Uh, you know, I, I remember in that the first encounter, the conversation was a lot around uh, destiny, purpose, calling, mm -hmm. uh, which was something that I was seeking and searching for. Yeah. Uh, but it turned into so much more than that as I began to get more of a, a well-rounded, uh, holistic exposure to the gospel mm -hmm. and, and, and everything. Uh, in terms of who Christ was, what he had done for us and his purposes and plans uh, for our life. And so I'm so thankful for that. And, and, and even in the sense that uh, it didn't start out as one conversation, what it grew into, it grew into something that helped make me successful as an athlete, mm. um, which, which is not uncommon to, to most of your, your audience listening here, yeah. is that I needed a coach I needed a team mm. and I needed a training regimen. And I've, I've really been spending a lot of time thinking about this lately um, as it pertains to, to, to my spiritual growth. Even now, as someone who's been a Christian 20 years, but also someone that wants to see other people thrive and flourish uh, in the things of God, is that we need someone who is uh, older than us, who's a mm. little bit further down the road who can challenge us, who will set the bar high for us and we'll set for ourselves yeah. uh, and really, and really press and lean into us into, you know, calling us up into the man or woman that God's called us to be. Uh, we also need peers. We need a team mm. of people, our age, kind of similar stage of life that we can actually run with, yeah. uh, you know, in that. And of course, you know, you think about all of the, um, you know, athletic analogies behind that, you know, we yeah. just finished our, our boot camp and our conditioning test here. Uh, for our men's and women's basketball program. And, and I'd be hard pressed to believe that any of those student athletes would be able to finish that on their own, mm -hmm. uh, but they can go harder and further because they look to the right or the left. They've got people with them, mm -hmm. you know, totally. and uh, that's something that I've certainly needed and continue to need uh, as I'm going after, after the things of God. And you need a training regimen, mm -hmm. um, man, you need to, to have, uh, you know, uh, spiritual disciplines. You need yeah. to have, um, um, you know, things that you're studying, you need to have a, a plan, you need to have a manual in terms of mm -hmm. uh, helping you go uh, above and beyond. Uh, because, hey, I appreciate, you know, church on Sunday morning and, and the occasional Wednesday service or, or, or conference that you go to. But that's really the bare minimum, just like mm -hmm. practice yeah. is the bare minimum. Look, every student athlete shows up to practice that just mm -hmm. gets you in the door. But if there's an expectation uh, to really grow and to perform at the highest level, you need to have your own personal training mm -hmm. regimen in addition to that. Yeah. Uh, and so that was something uh, that I was really coached in during my time as an early Christian. Mm. Uh, and I've seen value from both as an athlete, uh, but also now as a, as, as a man, a husband, a father, and someone that's going after the things of the Lord and, and making sure that, that those components are key ingredients that, that, I, that I have in front of me, not just during my early years yeah. as a Christian, but, but even here now today. So well said, Wayne. I've heard it said that in every Christian's life, you should have a Paul, someone who's who's at a higher level than you, spiritually more mature, has been through a, a longer life journey than you, 
you should have a, a Barnabas, someone who's at the same level in terms of their life stage and spiritual maturity, and then, and then a Timothy, someone that you're discipling, yeah. you're pouring into. And so could not agree more. Uh, community is, is vital. Uh, I think in sports, right, you got to have a, a community around you in terms of your career and being pushed. But in, in terms of your faith, as you mentioned, we need that push and we need that community to keep us accountable, keep us in line with what we believe and, and what's most important. Uh, it's easy in this industry to get trapped into the lie that our, our careers are most important, that, that it should take up every ounce of your time in forgetting that the most important thing is our relationship with Christ. So that, that's a powerful, a powerful reminder for our listeners, especially as they, they begin their journeys uh, in the sport industry. And Wayne, yeah. a question that came up for me as, as I was thinking about your journey is there was someone that brought you this message of the gospel. And so many people hear that message, especially in, in the modern day, social media, YouTube videos, preachers. I mean, the, the gospel is spread easier than it ever has been in history, but so many people don't follow Jesus. They don't choose to make uh, him their Lord and Savior. And so my question to you is what convinced you that the gospel was worth believing and then when did you actually give your life to Christ? Yeah, uh, well, I'll start uh, from what you finished. I gave my life to Christ July 12, 2003. Mm. And so that was the summer between uh, my sophomore and junior year mm. at KU. And yeah. um, I would say uh, the main thing that convinced me to believe the gospel is that, uh, man, Jesus is worth it. Yeah. Like there's no one that had ever you know, lived like he lived. There's no one that had ever you know, loved in the manner in which he loved. There's no one that had ever, um, you know, led and sacrificed their life like the mm -hmm. way that he sacrificed. And so uh, it's so interesting, you know, the psalmist, you know, tells this man that 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 many have looked and searched and found none like him. Mm -hmm. And like that was the case for me. And I was like, look, I've tried to lead my own life. I wrecked it. Um, you know, I, I've looked to other people, whether it was athletes or entertainers or, 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 or other folks in terms of Hey, who's worth following? And yeah. um, and it all paled in comparison uh, mm -hmm. to the life, to the person, and the and the work of Jesus Christ. And I was undone by that. I mean, it completely, uh, it completely overwhelmed me. And so, uh, it's something that uh, I not only recognized in awe, but I also knew that man, this isn't just someone to be in awe of or wowed by, mm. but this is someone who I actually have to submit my life to under his authority and leadership. And mm. I really think that's one of the components that a lot of people miss yeah. uh, is that there can be an excitement and an appreciation for Jesus as Savior. And that's certainly who he is. And there certainly should be that appreciation and excitement uh, behind that, you know, him yeah. him saving us from uh, from the consequences of our sin. But at the same time, there needs to be the reality that Jesus is Lord, mm. that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, too, that Jesus this isn't an add on to our life, uh, but he describes that all power and authority has been given to him. And so yeah. there is a, a measure of submission and surrender mm. that's required. And uh, and of course, being, you know, competitive, uh, independent uh, athletes like that's really hard for us. Mm. Um, but I'm here to tell you that someone that has experienced the fullness of that, uh, that, that, that it's worth it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's worth it. It's one of the hardest, uh, most challenging and rewarding things you'll ever do, uh, but it's totally worth it. And, uh, and, and my life's committed to, to inviting other people into that mm. uh, and then walking alongside them to, to helping them see that. And, you know, that's a key component as well. Like, I would not be where I'm at today in terms of my heart for the Lord, um, mm. you know, nor my passion for the gospel had I had not someone come in to walk closely with me in that yeah. uh, through through my flakiness. Uh, through my silly questions, mm -hmm. um, you know, through, you know, just all the uh, the different sentiment that young, you know, yeah. believers go through. It's not just that someone just threw a bunch of Bible verses at me and said, hey, figure it out. And, you know, right. hopefully uh, it'll latch on. But no, someone actually discipled me and walked along with me daily mm -hmm. uh, and helping me understand all that uh, all that the fullness of the gospel means. And so uh, that's that was really helpful for me as well. That's amazing, Wayne. I thought of Luke chapter 6 when Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? I think that's a challenging question that so many believers, I mean, including myself, and, and we need to think about that more. Are we under his authority in our daily lives? Are we under under submission, right? Following what he's called us into. I think that, that's so powerful. And I love what you said at the end there, too, that we need to be discipled. We need somebody that is pouring into us and guiding us. 
along this journey, especially early on. A lot of our listeners are just getting into their journey with Christ or have just started reading the Bible and understanding what, what Jesus is teaching. And so there needs to be discipleship along that journey. So very well yeah, said. For and sure. Totally agree. And you know something that I think we also miss is that the scriptures say that you will know them by by their fruit and talking about believers and walking with Christ and knowing that we're truly followers of Jesus by our actions. And so what transformations did you see happen in your life uh, after you started following Christ? Yeah, uh, well, it was, was certainly inside out transformation. Um, I think maybe sometimes we can get caught up with the, the outside in in terms of, hey, we want to start with the optics and the appearances first. Yeah. Uh, but there was really a heart change and transformation uh, in terms of, um, you know, how I viewed myself, how I viewed the world, how I viewed, you know, the Lord. Um, and so I think that's where it had initially started. And out of that, there was there was overflow into um, you know, uh, more of the, the, the outward uh, approach, whether it was the friend groups that I that I engaged with, whether it was the music that I listened to, whether mm. it was, you know, how I stewarded my money, whether it's what I do with my nightlife, whether yeah. it was uh, the, the content and the media that I was consuming. Then out of that, um, that's where the, the things really began to change. And, and, and I think something that really helped me with that is, uh, you know, early on, it's like a hunger for, for the word. Mm. Uh, and just to being able to, to read the word and, 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 and the word was faithful to do what it says it was going to do. I was transformed by the renewing of my mind. Yeah. Uh, and that happened as I began to engage and read the Bible every day. Mm. Um, you know, it was really interesting because, you know, and even still now, but during my academic experience, like uh, I, I was a, a dyslexic. And so like reading is not my most uh, effective learning style. Yeah. Um, you know, words are a moving target on the page for me. It's, it's very difficult, very burdensome. But man, there was just a real grace, uh, even that I still feel today. Mm. Um, you know, just when I open up the scriptures and just and just sit over them and read them, and and not just me read the word, but but uh, I heard it said, but allow the word to read you, mm. to read my thoughts and actions and intentions yeah. and motivations, uh, and that's where the real transformation came. And then. You couple that with uh, activating that faith, um, mm. you know, not just being hearers or readers of the word, but actually going out trying to do what it says. And that's where the real joy and excitement came from uh, that I think really broke some of the spiritual boredom that I think a lot of people experience is that, hey, when I read the Bible, like I wasn't just trying to collect facts or information mm. uh, about who God is or the way that he called me to live. But it's like, hey, I want to go out and try to do these things. And guess what? It it requires faith mm. and it requires a significant amount of risk and boldness. And there are times where I fell flat on my face. Yeah. Uh, there are times where there were huge triumphs, you know, mm. uh, which, which was really exciting uh, as well. And so I would say those were the, the, the key ingredients that helped, um, you know, me in that, that transformation process, you know, from the inside out. And, you know, I can remember people thinking originally, oh man, this is just a fad that Wayne's going through and uh, you know, th this will wear off. And, and, and it was pretty revealing that it wasn't until I stopped chasing women, like, you know, doing drugs and living crazy, that then all of a sudden people got worried about me. Mm. They're like, hey, whoa, whoa, Wayne, like, hey, are you, you okay, man? Like, yeah. is everything all right, man? You're, you're taking this Christianity thing a little bit a little bit too seriously. Mm. Um, but, hey, I felt like I had encountered the, the living God and, and his word was transforming me and and, uh, and I was all in. Mm. I love that, Wayne. it love what you said at the end there. I, I love Christian rap, and one of my favorite rappers is uh, is KB, and he has a, a new song, and it says, as long as I'm living, I'm not living Christian enough. And, and I think that's how we should approach our Christian lives is we're never meeting the standard, right? We're never doing enough. And, and I just laughed at what you said at the end that uh, you're almost living too Christian, and people were worried about you and, and living too close to Jesus. But if we want that life, we have to be in the Word, right? We have to know what God is calling us into, and, and we can't um, I think it's easy to get complacent as as believers, and especially in this part of the world where, you know, we face some persecution, but compared to what people face worldwide, it's it's, it's nothing. And so we, we can easily get a little bit complacent with with following Jesus and His commands, and um, really make, making it the first thing in our lives. So I love what you said there: um, being in the Word, knowing what God is calling us to, and and recognizing that this sanctification process of being transformed is lifelong. Uh, I, I've seen that in, in my in my three years following Jesus, just the ways He reveals your sinfulness. It's almost that the closer you get to Jesus, the more sinful you feel. 
but you also feel the grace even more. And so it's this process of, man, Lord, like I'm more sinful than I ever thought, uh, but you're also making me more like you each and every day. So I love, I love that you shared that and just being in the word and the value of that. I think it, it can easily be missed in the Christian life. And Wayne, you mentioned it a little bit, but you came to Christ. You had two years left at Kansas. You had a year, a couple years in, in the professionals after that. How did your newfound faith in Christ change your approach to the game of basketball? Uh, well, I think it changed me in the sense that because my identity and, and value and worth was no longer tethered to my performance hmm. or what people thought about me or what the newspapers was writing about me, it, uh, it actually freed me up to, to play, you know, probably the, the, the best years of my career, you know, my, yeah. my junior and senior year, you know, immediately after becoming a Christian. And uh, it was great and just freeing to be able to, to take the court and, uh, again, no longer play for, um, you know, a stat sheet or, um, you know, a crowd full of people or NBA scouts that were watching, but, but playing uh, in, in um, you know, in a lot of ways for, just, you know, an audience of one hmm. uh, to where that, you know, it didn't matter what the outcome was or the, or the performance. Um, you know, if my heart posture and my efforts were to, to glorify and honor God, um, then, you know, I felt affirmed in, in, in what I was able to be able to accomplish in that, you know, 40 minutes of competition, uh, no matter the outcome. But also it wasn't just an out. Uh, it drove me to competitive excellence. Mm. Um, you know, when you look at the life of Christ, he did all things in excellence. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, teaching, preaching uh, his relationships. You know, he was a carpenter. You know, I know the scriptures don't say much about it, but I can't help but to believe that he was an excellent carpenter, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and so it made my work ethic, um, you know, increase. It made even my competitive level uh, increase. Now, it was redeemed and harnessed in a way that was honoring to God prior to that. Like, I didn't care who I had to step on or who I had to talk yeah. trash to or cheap shot to get the win or the point. Um, but I'm so thankful that the competitiveness that was wired in me uh, was redirected and uh, in a lot of ways, uh, reconciled uh, back to Christ uh, in in a holistic and a, in a redemptive way, uh, mm -hmm. and playing for Him, and yeah. wanting to honor and glorify Him, and to being able to to invite others into that, and to being able to use uh, you know my platform and success and notoriety uh, not to to gain more attention for myself, mm -hmm. uh, but to be able to use that uh, to share of His goodness and faithfulness, which uh, which I had an opportunity to do several times at, at Kansas and beyond. That's amazing, Wayne. And really that freedom you talked about, I think so many people seek that without knowing that the answer is Christ. And you think about the sport industry and our listeners who, who just have this desire to work full-time in athletics, it's competitive. Man, it's competitive. So many young people are fighting for internships, GA positions, full-time jobs. And, and how do you harness that in a way that you mentioned where you want to be excellent, but in God's way and trying to gain yeah. God, God's approval, right? Instead of the approval of, of those around us and, and our leaders. Uh, so I think that's a great testimony that truly that can come from Christ in a yeah. genuine relationship with him. So thanks for sharing. Yeah. That. And, and, you know, uh, you know, Jesus is the, is the full expression of what our human experience uh, is yeah. like. And so even Amen. the dynamic of competition, yeah. even though, you know, I believe, you know, Jesus never picked up a basketball or swung a baseball or, 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 you know, was in a timeout with, with a clipboard. Yeah. Um, you know, we understand that, you know, in the midst of the overarching narrative of the Bible, where, I mean, there's a cosmic battle, yeah. uh, you know, that was taking place that still, even to this day, mm. is the place that, that yeah. we see, um, you know, the Lord and his people are having to engage in, you know, on a daily basis. And mm. so I don't think that, you know, competition should be foreign to the Christian expression. I think we should be the best at it because okay. we understand, uh, you know, the, the battle between, you know, sin, death, and the grave was ultimately won, you know, by Christ. Yeah. Uh, he competed and warred against that. Uh, but yeah. then there's also, you know, principalities and powers that we have to battle uh, even to this day mm. uh, that, that Christ and his spirit um, empower and in boldness to be able to do that. And so, um, you know, I would hate for our, your, your listeners, whether, uh, you know, they're, you know, aspiring administrators, coaches, or maybe even current athletes now to look at or to view a competitive mindset or disposition that they might have and think that it's not useful to God. Mm. Uh, I think you'd be very, very mistaken uh, to have that 
uh, that notion, uh, but to understand that, man, this is maybe the way that God's wired you uh, and that he wants to harness it and, and to redeem it for, for his, um, you know, greater purposes and not just so you can climb some corporate ladder or so that you can win a few games. Yeah, that's so well said, Wayne. And it's so true, right, that this competitive spirit, you know, God made us, right? He made the way that we think, the way that we feel. Uh, and so that competitive nature is something that God ha- has put into us naturally as humans. So if we can use that for His glory and according to His Word and in a way that honors Him, I think it could be very useful for the mission of the gospel and in, and in careers. And Wayne, in 2005, did want to transition to your career in the NBA. You were drafted by the Miami Heat, and I can only imagine the the new set of challenges that you faced as a believer in in professional sports and really in in an industry that is filled with temptation. So how did you face those challenges as you began your pro basketball career? Yeah, uh, well, I think it, it, a lot of it goes back to a, a word that I used uh, earlier in, uh, in the pod in the word of, of being discipled. Uh, you know, I had some older guys uh, really invested in, and involved in my life, uh, so much so that actually when I, I had an opportunity, you know, to consider leaving school early and uh, entering the draft after my, my junior year, but I had just become a Christian less than a year before. And, and these guys challenged me. They says, hey, your, your game, you know, may be ready, but man, do you think you're ready, um, you know, in your, in your maturity and in the foundations of your faith mm. if you were to end up in a city like Miami? And the answer was no. And so uh, a big reason why I stayed my senior year uh, in school was to to continue to see that that wow. foundation firmed up uh, so that when, you know, eventually I was, you know, drafted to to, um, you know, to, to Miami in, in, a, in a city that could be difficult to live in uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I felt ready. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it wasn't ready. I'm ready to do this on my own. But guess what? Some of those same guys, the coaches and teammates that were in my life, like I'm flying them down to stay with me for mm-hmm. weeks at a time. In Miami, I'm flying them out on the road with me uh, to make sure that uh, that I'm staying strong and um, wow. and being held accountable. If they couldn't come, hey, I'm asking, hey, can you help me find someone in Phoenix, in Toronto, uh, in Denver, uh, who I can, hey, if it gets rough in the hotel, man, I'll go sleep on their couch, mm. uh, man. And so it was great to be able to have uh, those type of folks in me uh, involved in my life. And then also, you know, I got connected with, with the local church there. Mm. Um in, in South Florida, uh, the Harbor Church uh, was just celebrated their 20th anniversary. I got a chance to go back to that here recently and uh, share on, on, on a Sunday morning how much uh, that group of people and that, that house uh, really meant to me. And, and I, can't, uh, I can't overstate just the importance of, of being rooted and grounded and being a contributing mm-hmm. member, uh, not just someone that shows up, and consumes, you know, what a church has to offer, but a contributing member. Mm. Uh, on uh, Sunday to, to, to a local body. Yeah. Uh, and so much in a way is I, I think one thing that, that can be missed a lot of times when you're, when you're fighting or trying to stay away from, from temptation or things that will pull you away from God, isn't that you just wait idle and, and hope that you don't slip into temptation or hope that mm-hmm. you, don't, you don't fall, um, but is actually to activate your life into what God's doing. Yeah. And then as you're activating your life and you're joined with other people, guess what? It crowds out opportunity uh, for those things to be able, you know, to trip you up. It, it places you in community and kind of gives you, um, you know, a hedge of protection uh, because you're so active in, in, in the things of the Lord. And, and I would certainly say that was the case for me, mm. uh, not only during my time um, in Miami as, a, as an NBA player, but, but even now and and uh, and of course, I don't want people to 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 think that, um, you know, hey, an, an NBA player uh, has any more temptation than mm. someone else. Yeah. Like it's it's all the same. Mm. Uh, the, the, the same enemy, you know, the same yep. devil is, is 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 prowling around, um, you know, looking to, to kill, kill, steal and destroy. Yeah. Uh, whether it's a, a first round draft pick, whether it's a stay at home mom, whether it's a GA, you know, in an yeah. athletic department. And so, hey, stay on guard, stay intentional um, and, and activate your life around the things of God. Mm, that's so powerful, Wayne. I, I love what you mentioned about the guardrails and accountability that you sought out during your time in Miami. I, I think one thing that we often can feel tempted to do as believers is oh, I don't really need accountability because, you know, I think God's going to give me the strength to handle it. You got no chance. You got I'm no, just like, let's just be real, yeah, man. You got, you got, you got no a chance. snowball chance in hell trying to yeah. do this thing on your own. 
Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. why you need you need other folks uh, sure in, in your life. And, and, and one thing is you think about it like, you know, the, the Christian kind of growth or progression is unto maturity. Yeah. Okay. So think about this, like the language around our salvation is 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 in a lot of ways tethered to being born again. Yep. Right. So you're an infant, you're a child, and there's going to stage in your life where you need to be treated as such. Mm. And you're going to need more care and attention. Right. From yeah. from older believers and, and things of that nature. Uh, but it needs to be unto growth and maturity. Like mm. you at some point need to be able to transition from, as the word says, from from milk to meat. Yeah. Right. You need to be able to have uh, someone that, that isn't. Uh, always calling you and and knowing how to ask you the right questions so you can reveal what's really going on in your heart. At some point in time, you have to be mature enough to say, hey, I'm going to go out and seek some help. I'm going to go out and seek some counsel. And then I'm going to open up my life and reveal to them, hey, man, these are some things that I'm struggling with. Mm. These are some areas that I need some some insight and uh, someone to speak into my life to. And so I think that transition is, is really, really important, uh, especially for folks that are, that are growing, um, you know, obviously in their physical age. But as you're getting more and more responsibility, yep. uh, whether it's in your, your, your life or, or uh, your personal life or, or professionally. Mm, yeah, 100 percent. It really is something that I think we we can almost be afraid to do is step out and either be really honest about a, a sin struggle or a battle in our lives or just find accountability to prevent sin struggles from from happening in our lives. I think that's been I mean, my journey and obviously as well as yours, something that has been a huge grace from God is the accountability he can provide. And to your point earlier that it's it can sometimes and most oftentimes come from a local church body that you're planted with, connected with, like you said, an active member. Uh, I think that's a great way to look at a, a local church commitment is not, not just a Sunday bench warmer, but somebody that's involved and, and is connected and committed to that community. And Wayne, something I thought of in just considering your career in Miami is you had a locker room full of individuals that most likely did not have the same faith you had. How did you have the boldness and confidence during your time there to share your faith and be a witness to those guys? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, the ecosystems from, you know, transitioning to, you know, becoming a Christian at KU and then my last two years there. Um, you know, the weight and influence that I had was different. Yeah. Uh, even though I had just become a new believer, you know, I was captain on the team. I was all American and I had the biggest voice in the locker room. And so it, it wasn't um, too big of a, of a jump in that uh, mm-hmm. in that ecosystem. But, yeah. you know, then I transitioned to being the, the rookie, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the only Christians uh, in the locker room and to, to not having a lot of weight and influence and pull. And, you know, I'm just thankful that, you know, I felt like the Holy Spirit just gave me some some tact and some some wisdom mm. uh, had, you know, had my antenna kind of in tune to, hey, when to wait for my pitch, when to swing yeah. uh, in terms of how I would engage, you know, with guys. I, I quickly found that um, the more effective opportunities to preach the gospel in that stage of my life wasn't going to be in big groups, Mm. um, but it was usually going to be in kind of one-on-one conversations. Um, It was usually going to be between, hey, living the gospel, manifest the word first, you know, let the word become flesh through your life, Mm. uh, and then uh, make yourself available, you know, for those opportunities to be able to to speak it into God's lives. And so, um, you know, that was uh, the case for, for this season, uh, for that season of life. Um, you know, it, it looks different now, yeah. uh, you know, where I'm at. But, um, you know, one of the more enjoyable things during that time was uh, to walk into the locker room daily. And even I feel the same way as I walk into the office daily is to know that I'm partnering with the Holy Spirit mm. and, and what he wants me to do Amen. and who he wants me to engage with. Um, and I even include my work in that and how to do my work excellently. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you could feel uh, alone and maybe put off, uh, but I can't help but but be reminded and have to remind myself regularly, you know, that one of the, the most repeated realities uh, throughout all of Scripture is that the Lord's going to be with us. Mm. Uh, and so we can take confidence and, and, and courage in that. Yeah. Uh, and as you just have your eyes open and your ears ready for those things, uh, and, and I hinted at it earlier, like it adds so much adventure and fun to a day. You know, mm. what well, you could look at a schedule and see, man, this is, you know, ordinary, mundane day. 
of, you know, meetings, Excel spreadsheets, practices and the like. Yeah. Um, but you know what? If you actually tune your ear to the Holy Spirit, maybe ask the Lord, hey, what do you want me to do in this moment? Mm. Um, you know, he starts to show things to you and yeah. uh, and it can be be pretty fun and exhilarating. Uh, even the things that, that we have to do repetitively or that might seem to be uh, ordinary and mundane. Oh, sure, Ken. I love that you shared that and even taking you know, your, your career and something that, that was such a blessing in your life of playing in the league and even what you're doing now and seeing it as a ministry. I think that's what, what I hope for our listeners is that they would see their careers through that lens, that this is an opportunity that God has given you and given us to utilize this career and these opportunities to glorify Him and as a way to share our faith with with others and have that spiritual antenna, as you mentioned. So love that we're able to share that and be a light both in Miami and, and now back in Lawrence. And Wayne, I think uh, another just really cool part of your journey is you stepped away from the game of basketball in 2009 uh, to pursue a calling to campus ministry with Call to Greatness. What challenges did you face in making that transition from playing the game you loved to now being in a ministry setting? Yeah, um, I mean, there, there are plenty of challenges, uh, you know, in that transition. Uh, all of it was worth it. Um, I do it over again a thousand times if I could go back and, and to replay it. But, uh, you know, I remember particularly uh, when I made that transition, um, you know, it was I was still pretty young. I think I might have been 25 or 26. I've been fighting through some injuries and, and um, you know, was was working my way back from those. And I still had uh, a lot of, you know, drive and ambition and, and ability to keep playing the game. Mm. Um, but one thing that I, I remember is during the off season, I would come back to Lawrence and would be basically mentoring or discipling young guys uh, like had happened when I was a student athlete. And it really made my heart come alive. Mm. Um, uh, I was married uh, shortly after that. And my wife, her heart was really uh, engaged and uh, ignited for the Lord through a campus ministry at, at Florida State. Uh, and so it was something that was kind of a part of our DNA and, and uh, you know, that, that we did pretty regularly. And so I, when I found my heart being more excited and drawn towards, um, you know, preaching the gospel and, and discipling, uh, you know, college, college, um, college age kids. Um, and when I would go back to training camp or things like that, I'd kind of be going through the motion. It became really yeah. apparent that this is something that the Lord was calling us to do. And, and it was tough because, you know, um, you know, there was still, you know, a lot of notoriety around being a professional athlete. Obviously, the money was amazing. Mm. Um, you know, it was around 2008 where the, um, you know, one of the financial crisis had just happened. And, yeah. you know, there are a lot of people like, hey, dude, what are you doing? Like, you're going to leave. You're going to walk away from all that. Or, you know, wait, you were just a first round draft pick a few years ago. And now you're going to go have to raise your own, you know, financial support to be able mm. to go and be a mission. Like, who does that? Like, what are you doing? Um, yeah. But it was all worth it. You know, mm -hmm. it was all worth it. And so I uh, made that transition and, and uh, was in on the campus uh, mission field for, for 13 years uh, wow. with my wife and a, an incredible team of people wow. uh, here locally um, in Lawrence with, with Call to Greatness and got a chance to serve a lot of different campuses uh, at a lot of different levels from, yeah. from junior college all the way to D1. And uh, it was it was incredible. I love that, Wayne. It really does show a level of sacrifice that God has given you through the spirit and you know, how challenging that would be. You think about you reach the pinnacle of, of, of basketball and at the pro level. And uh, seemingly from the outside, many would believe that, as you mentioned, that was a, a mistake to leave and, and serve in ministry. But um, I think it's amazing to serve on God's battlefield daily, right, as, as opposed to serving on, on a basketball court or, or elsewhere in the sports industry. And so I love that you shared that. And really, yeah, and I never, re I never really bought into that, you know, and felt uncomfortable and, and, yeah. and refused it a couple of times. They were, oh man, you're giving them so much, you're giving them so much. It's like, well, I mean, again, it pales in comparison to what Christ gave up for us, 100%. right? And, uh, you know, as his yeah. spirit lives in us, as we are, you know, beneficiaries of the work that Christ has done, mm. you know, it's only fitting, you know, that, yeah. that we would lay down our lives and give it, give it back to him. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, by, by no means do I want to communicate that being in the mission field is more holy or mm. useful to God than uh, being a professional athlete for yeah. his glory or yeah. being a collegiate athlete, a athletic administrator right now yeah. as I'm currently in and doing that with excellence, but also yeah. coupled, you know, with, um, you know, a, a faith foundation. And so 
I would certainly hate for people to to misconstrue that in the sense yeah. of, oh, I need to, to leave everything what I'm doing. It's like, hey, man, take it before the Lord. Is that is that what he's calling you to do uh, yeah. in that moment? And I love that, uh, you know, that the, the gospel and the, the spirit are, are powerful enough mm. that they can use anyone in any season of life, in any, you know, vocation, whether it's full time mm. vocational ministry or if you're, you know, professional um, in uh, you know, in the, in the, in the executive world, or if you're a stay at home mom, or if you're retired. Mm. So, uh, so I'm, I'm excited for the Lord to continue to use me, uh, no matter what, mm. uh, my job title is. I love that you said that Wayne and, and God can really use any, as you mentioned, any career, any life stage to advance the gospel. And so it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I always tell people, if you're a Christian, I don't care if you're, if you're a plumber if you're an airline pilot, it doesn't matter. You are in ministry, and that is a guarantee. And so we can use anything uh, in any position, in any title uh, for God's glory. And so I love that you mentioned that. That is that is truly an important point. And I want to transition, Wayne, to what you're doing right now at the Kansas Athletic Department as an associate AD of engagement and outreach. You joined staff in 2021. What led you to step into a career on the business side of athletics? Yeah, uh, what was interesting is I had been serving on the on the college campus, you know, for all those years in campus ministry, and uh, a lot of that was significantly integrated with with collegiate athletics. Uh, just how much I learned during that time, how even though I wasn't aspiring for a career to do anything else, that you know I was being you know sharpened and honed uh, to be able to uh, bring something to the table when it came to uh, an opportunity to serve in, in athletic administration and. Um, obviously, this place, the University of Kansas, means a lot to me uh, in, a, uh, in a variety of ways and was really excited about uh, some of the new leadership uh, that had just uh, taken over here. And mm-hmm. uh, we found a lot of alignment and synergy uh, with uh, my heart for this place, with my exposure and uh, service to it for so long. And then also with a lot of the core values that I have, which which all of them are rooted uh, in the gospel. And so mm. uh, I was excited to, to transition uh, into a, an administrative role and, and still uh, have the opportunity to be able to help young lives flourish and uh, to be able to create uh, an environment that, that can benefit a lot of people. Mm. And so um, in that transition out of, uh, you know, campus ministry, uh, if I can say out of, I, I don't necessarily yeah. fully believe it's all the way out of. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the role is a little bit different, but the mission is, is still very much the same mm. in, uh, in loving, serving, caring for and developing people, um, you know, through uh, sports, but also, um, you know, fully, fully integrated with with my faith in Christ. That's amazing, Wayne. And love that you mentioned, too, that you, you connect the, the two things, right? Your faith in Jesus and your career at, at, U, at KU is, is not a separate thing, right? It is it is connected. No, it's all one thing. On, yeah, it's all one thing. It's got. Uh, it's got to be. It's got to be. Yeah, it's all one thing. There's no hey, you know, you're working now. Okay, you're off now. Like check mm. your faith at the door, or hey, what's yeah. your life work balance like now? That it's all connected. Like mm. it's it's all one thing. And um, you know, I love that. You know, probably one of my my favorite portions of scripture uh, in all the Bible, uh, Colossians one. Uh, 13 through 20, it talks about all things have been reconciled to Christ through the shedding of his blood. All that, that word, all is used over and over and over again in that, that portion of scripture. And so uh, I fully believe that, mm-hmm. that, that every part of my life is, uh, is surrendered and, and useful and sacred, sacred to God. Yeah. Um, again, whether it's uh, preaching the gospel formally, being on a podcast or uh, mm-hmm. filling out a contact report from a donor or helping with scheduling or strategic yeah. plan or, or anything. Uh, that I'm faced with on a daily basis as, a, as an administrator now. Mm, that's amazing, Wayne. And, and I think so many young people that are listening can can agree, right, that, yes, let's I want to use my career in athletics as a ministry, but they may not know practically how to do that. So what are some ways that you practically use your role at KU as a ministry? Yeah, well, I would say, first off, do your job well. Mm. Like, Hey, let's be clear. Amen. No one cares about your Christian witness if you suck at your job. Amen. If you're, you know, unreliable, if you can point out problems and not bring solutions, like no one really cares about that. Mm. And, you know, one of the more uh, potent things about uh, the Christian expression is that the Bible works in every part of life. I love that the Bible talks a significant amount about finances and economics. Guess what? Pretty much every major decision in college athletics the last, you know, 18 months has been centered around 
economics and finances. Yeah. And guess what? The Bible has a lot to say about how to steward and to shepherd uh, finances, how to do things in a just manner, you know, how to avoid uh, corruption and greed. And, yeah. uh, and, and guess what? We need people in this industry that are going to activate those truths when it comes to these very um, topics that we're talking about because the implications of those topics affect lives. Yeah. And it either causes those lives to flourish or it can bring uh, oppression and brokenness. And so mm. uh, so we need people in that space. And so the first thing you got to do is like you got to do your job well. Amen. Uh, and I'm so thankful that, that the word is applicable to everything, whether it's yeah. communication, whether it's relationships. Uh, I mean, so much of the word of God is, is useful. And uh, and I'm here to say that that, that it works. Hmm. Um, the second yeah. is, you know, I, you know, there there is wisdom intact. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to know, uh, you know, when it's appropriate, man, maybe when it's not the right timing, you know, to be able to, um, you know, maybe share your faith with someone. You got to know how to ask questions. Um, but also there's times where, hey, I've got to be bold. Uh, I've got to be unafraid. I've got to be unashamed uh, to be able to step up and to speak out if you feel like maybe the environment that you're in or the policies that you're having to operate under are encroaching upon uh, your faith and, and your values. And, and I know there's been plenty of moments uh, here in the last 18 months uh, for me personally and for a lot of other people out there uh, where you have to take a stand and uh, and really uh, activate your faith, what you believe and why you believe it, yeah. um, especially if it encroaches on uh, on your faith values and mm. and really see, you know, I, I, uh, I think this worldview is really important, too, is yeah. being able to have the Bible as the lens in which you see the world through. Yeah. Um, and so that's a, a real practical way uh, to be able to, 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 to do that as well. I thought of that, Wayne. That's, that's so powerful. Uh, the first point, I mean, man, that, that is so true, right? If you don't do your job well, your Christian witness will suffer. And, and then living your life through a biblical lens. I, I think one thing we miss, and man, it's so, it's so unfortunate in, in, in the postmodern era, is so often we forget that our lives are not defined by the secular view but they're defined by the Christian view and how, how God calls us to live in Scripture. And, and that's a great way to be a witness to Christ and His love is, is to obey and stay faithful to His Word, regardless of what the world might tell you to do that, that counters that. So I think it's a powerful uh, way to look at our, our witnesses. It's obedience to God's Word, standing firm on that truth that we stand by. Uh, that's, oh, that's an awesome way to, to put that, Wayne. And Wayne, my last question for you is you do have this this amazing testimony, this amazing journey, how God has used you and your platform. What can our listeners take away and learn from your testimony? Uh, man, wow. I mean, there, there, there's a lot there. Uh, and I'm excited that, that my testimony just didn't stop uh, during that time back in 2003 when I came to know the Lord, but it's continuing to grow and, 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 uh, and fashion and be shaped. Um, you know, as far as far as a, a takeaway, I, I guess I would just say the man Jesus is worth it. Like yeah. man, he, he's worthy. Uh, mm. Is his kingdom and and all that he is is uh, is is worth any type of you know suffering, persecution, yeah. sacrifice uh, that that will be required of you mm. and expect it to be required of you. Amen. Expect this Christian journey, this Christian walk to be one of the hardest things you've ever done mm. uh, because um, the way that Jesus had to accomplish it was the hardest thing ever done, uh, mm. which was, was what he endured on the cross mm. uh, for all of us. And, uh, yeah. and I just uh, appreciate um, kind of a, a saying that I heard uh, as a young Christian in that it's, you know, Christians go to heaven, but disciples change the world. Mm. And, you know, I'm thankful for, um, you know, the salvation offered through Christ and, and, and the, you know, the future grace and the future, you know, reality of being with him, you know, yeah. forever. Uh, yeah. But I'm also equally as excited about bringing heaven to earth. Yeah. Um, you know, even as, as we hear uh, in the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven, there's actually a, a route that I take to campus every single day. Uh, I go out of my way to take this route just because it, it kind of crests up over a hill and I can see the entirety of, of the University of Kansas. Every single day I do this and, and, and I activate a prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done uh, at KU as it is in heaven. Um, mm. And 
know, that's that's really the the heart for my life and not just here when in the environment and the campus and the people that I serve, but but also, you know, expand that uh, far beyond that. Um, and and I, I would just encourage and challenge and invite other people uh, to live uh, in that way. Um, you know, it's amazing. Mm, that's amazing, Wayne. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's an amazing takeaway. And I think our listeners can truly see that a life committed to Christ, regardless of how successful you are, is the best way to live. And I love that you mentioned that. And, you know, Wayne, just thank you for taking time to share your story with us and, and being willing to stand firm in, in your values and in your faith as you serve God in college athletics. So thanks for your time and looking forward to yeah. sharing this. Come on, let's change the world. Let's do it. And uh, thanks so much mm. uh, for having me on and, and uh, carry on, man. Stay the course in your ministry and getting these stories out there and uh, proclaiming the truth and, and encouraging other people along the way. If you want to get involved with Uncommon Sports Group and the mission that we are on to help you navigate the sport industry as followers of Christ, apply for our academy on our website at UncommonSG.org. That's UncommonSG.org. Be sure to catch new episodes of the Uncommon Podcast every other week on Thursdays at midnight Eastern Time. Until next time, we pray that you will strive to be uncommon by glorifying the name of God in whatever you may do. See you next time.